David Brewster here with New Brewster's Millions of Rants, and this is the Goblin Album, and I've been posting about this on Facebook, and I thought I'd make this video and share it here on YouTube as well, but I'm right in the middle of recording a new instrumental music project, or album, and uh, I'm basically targeting and paying tribute to Goblin, the legendary, you know, Italian prog rock and soundtrack band. I've been a Goblin fan technically since I was about 10 years old, and I saw the original Dawn of the Dead with my sister. Of course, our parents had no idea we were watching that, but I do remember, you know, being shocked by the film, but also really digging, like, the kind of classic, you know, 70s soundtrack, and then eventually, as years rolled on, I started playing guitar, and then suddenly, you know, discovered that I really liked this band. Of course, I'm a big prog rock fan or nerd, and when I made that connection, like, wait, Goblin is Dawn of the Dead? And then I started listening to more of their music, and now I'm hopelessly obsessed. I mean, definitely Goblin rules. So the legendary guitarist from Goblin, Massimo Morante, he actually passed away a couple years ago, unfortunately, and definitely a driving force behind the band and one of the original members. And, you know, I definitely remember being kind of confused by Goblin albums and their history and discography because they have a lot of music. You know, a lot of people just think of Suspiria and Dawn of the Dead, but they have lots of music, you know, aside from those two. And they have albums that are kind of standalone you know, Goblin albums that aren't associated with a film or a soundtrack, and those are great too. We're going to discuss that briefly in this episode, but definitely, you know, Massimo Morante is a legendary guitarist, and I was really upset, you know, to discover his passing recently. Now, as far as Goblin's albums, the two I'm going to recommend highly are Cherry 5, which is technically Goblin's first album. It was actually recorded before they were Goblin. They were actually Oliver when they recorded this. This album is brilliant, and I recently discovered this, and now I have it on vinyl and on CD, too. And the CD hasn't left my car, you know, the CD player in my car, for months. Also, Roller, too, is excellent. And both of these are kind of standalone Goblin albums. Roller uh, does have some music that does appear in soundtracks, but it wasn't originally recorded as a soundtrack album. And then Cherry 5 is just pure prog from the early 70s. And of course, i got to open up the gatefold on Roller. I mean, that's essential right there. There's Goblin right there, prime time. And I highly recommend both these albums, Roller and Cherry 5. But I also recommend really any of Goblin's you know, albums or soundtracks. It's all great. But these two are great places to start. So I have talked about this on Facebook a little bit and posted about it, but I wanted to add this to this video, and that's Goblin's book, Seven Notes in Red. I recently just completely devoured this book. It's pretty hefty, too. There's about 600 pages. A uh, complete overview and history. There's tons of photos and stuff. Um, if you're curious about this band, you know, I can't stress this enough. You have to check this book out. It cleared up all this confusion I had as far as their history and member changes. You know, a complete discography, talked about the early years and sessions and all sorts of stuff. And definitely one insight with this book that really opened up my mind is I have spent years and years, if not decades, you know, reading and consuming books and magazine articles and, you know, uh, documentaries and stuff like that I've watched, you know, soaking up progressive rock history, you know, and a lot of the books that I've read and things that I've seen or, you know, learned centered on European, specifically British, you know, prog rock. You know, kind of what was happening in the 70s in England and also in America. But this book opened my eyes to the Italian perspective of what was happening at that exact same time. But the Italian bands, and Goblin, and the soundtracks and stuff, but, you know, how they were heavily inspired by bands like King Crimson and Yes and ELP and Gentle Giant and bands like that. And you can hear it in their music, but having that backstory and history and understanding what they were listening to and what they were inspired by, and then the music and sounds that poured out. I mean, this really opened my mind. All right, now that I've shared all that, I'm going to talk about my album. So this year is the 20th anniversary of me recording and releasing instrumental, you know, albums like this. You know, the first one I made back in, uh, and released back in 2004 was called Vertigo, and that's like an acoustic, you know, all acoustic, um, kind of melodic, instrumental, mood. I don't really know how to describe that one. It's, it was definitely an experiment when I made it, 
And then over the years, I've just issued and continued making these albums, recorded at home, using whatever computer and studio setup I had at that time. And when I originally started doing this, you know, I did sell, you know, like sell copies to students and some friends and stuff and gave them out to family members or friends. But then eventually I started to kind of gain a following. You know, I've been posting the albums on Bandcamp and the last five albums that I've released, including my greatest hits, uh, which I haven't really had any hits, but it's a compilation of some of my best work called Body Bag. That actually came out right in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, the last five albums I've released have done very well, better than any of the albums I've ever released before. And there's been more, you know, excitement and attention. I've had some people out there, you know, watching my channel here asking, can you share some behind the scenes, you know, stuff while you're recording or working on music? And that's what I'm attempting to do in this episode right now is just share kind of what I'm working on, kind of turn the camera on and kind of record and document some of this stuff as far as equipment and music. Obviously, I'm kind of sharing this backstory on Goblin since that's the theme of my new album, but I have been doing this for a very long time. So my new album is called Nilbog, which is Goblin spelled backwards, and it's totally a tribute to Goblin. And, you know, basically this year I've just been very obsessed and just hopelessly obsessed with this band. Last year it was a lot of Camel and Gentle Giant, which probably steered my brain and ears toward where I am right now. And then somewhere around Christmas and the New Year's, I started listening to Goblin again, you know, frantically and diving deeper, going into albums I'd never listened to and listening to music I'd never listened to. I discovered the Cherry 5 album, I bought the book, started watching concerts and documentaries and stuff online, and now, yeah, I'm just full-blown obsessed. And the music, basically, I started to kind of compose, you know, some of these songs and riffs and progressions and melodies and stuff, and it was kind of sounding to me a little bit like Goblin, and then I got the uh, Electroharmonic C9 organ machine pedal, and as soon as I bought that, plugged it in and started playing with some of my ideas. It was like a light bulb went off over my head, and I've been basically, you know, hitting this head on ever since. So as far as the music itself and the gear I'm using for this project, I'm very aware of Goblin's sound and overall musical style, and I'm trying to emulate and channel that as much as I can. And, you know, with the drums, the guitars, the bass, and the keyboard and organ stuff, too. And as far as the pedals and stuff, Definitely the exotic SP compressor is being, you know, used on almost every track and every instrument. Uh, there's an assortment of phase, you know, I got the MXR Deep Phase, also the Phase 95s down on my pedal board. Those two pedals kind of give me a variety of phase, because there's definitely a lot of phase in uh, Goblin's music, either on bass, keyboards, and also on guitar. And I have used the SL Drive from Exotic on a couple tracks. And definitely the big showcase, of course, is the Electroharmonic C9 organ machine. That's helping me kind of emulate and channel some of those synth organ, you know, kind of sounds, some of those spooky kind of eerie sounds in Goblin's music. So all this together, basically using the Paul Reed Smith mainly for the synth and the organ parts. Uh, the Les Paul is mainly being used for the rhythm parts, you know, power chords. I did use it on a couple solos. And then I recorded a funk kind of inspired track last night. And that's a combination of everything. Paul Reed Smith on the organ, uh, the Telecaster for the kind of skanky, you know, scratch and sniff funk rhythm, and then the Strat, you know, for the lead parts. But that was actually just last night. But I'm trying to kind of mix it up and, you know, use different guitars, different pedals, different tones. That way each song has a little bit different flavor and sound. So now I'm going to demo the Electroharmonic C9 organ machine, and this is actually a really cool pedal. I do remember checking these out when they first, you know, were released. I think that was about 10 years ago or so now. Um, maybe not quite 10 years ago, but this has been on the market for a while. And I remember I checked it out originally, I was like, man, that's cool, and then completely forgot about them. I mean, not completely, but I didn't really have a use for one. I didn't really aggressively go out and buy one, obviously. But then leading up to, you know, the recording phase for my new project, I already had an idea what I was going to do. I knew I needed this. I knew I needed to capture, you know, some of those synth and keyboard sounds. And uh, I watched all the demos online. This one definitely had the best tones, I thought. And uh, very inspiring. It's definitely kind of opened my mind, not only as far as what I, you know, am playing and how I'm playing things, you know, while using it, 
but also how I'm playing things and what I'm doing while I'm not using it. It's really interesting too, like while you're playing, because you can leave certain parts of a chord held down, you know, while you're, you know, using this pedal. And then you can start changing, you know, notes within a chord and you can hear it, the way it sustains and everything. And, you know, initially when I plugged into it and started using it, I wanted to see how, you know, quickly I could confuse it. So I started shredding and stuff, you know, while it was plugged in. And it doesn't really track like pure shred. So if your last name's, you know, Malmsteen or Satriani or something, this probably won't track shredding, like pure shredding. I couldn't get it to do it because eventually if I started running things, you know, kind of fast, it obviously got confused and mistracked and stuff. And sometimes it would just freak out. So it's not really like a shred thing. I've mainly been using it for like chords and sustain notes, and melodies, and creating some of those eerie sounds that you hear in Goblin's music. So I'm going to do a demo of this and just kind of run through a couple things that I discovered, you know, while playing with this pedal. All right, now I'm going to do a quick demo of the Electroharmonic C9 organ machine. I'm going to use a section from one of the songs from my new album, and this is from La Strega. And I actually posted kind of a raw demo of this on Facebook a few days ago. And this is one of the first things I wrote or composed in preparation for this project. And there's uh, basically a clean guitar part, and then another part where I use the organ machine kind of doubling this picking pattern. And there's a real stretchy, you know, chord part. And this is just the raw, like, clean guitar tone. This is just the guitar, like this. <laughs> basically repeats that a few times and eventually starts stretching like this. part and then I basically used the organ machine and doubled that and that was kind of a test for me to see like how is this organ machine gonna do because there's some kind of tense dissonant you know tonalities in those chords but it did a great job and here's the exact same part but now with the C9 organ machine turned on and I'm using the first sound tone wheel and it sounds like this <laughs> because it handled those dissonant tonalities and those kind of weird, you know, intervals between the chords there. And that kind of basically just, you know, lit a fire under my butt. And then I continued to record and write and experiment. And that's where I am right now. Okay, now what I'm going to do is basically demo all nine sounds from the organ machine. And I'm basically got the dry guitar all the way off and the organ all the way up. And then the mod and click uh, knobs are both at 12 o'clock. And then I'm going to basically go through all nine, you know, selections. So tone wheel is the first sound. And with that setting, it sounds like this. <laughs> touch sensitive too. You might have heard it kind of like chirp right there. You really have to be careful as far as like how hard you're picking because if you pick hard it's going to jump in volume. If you pick light it may not actually pick up you know the note that you played. So you really have to kind of change the way you play you know while using this pedal. Next up's the setting prog. Definitely a Keith Emerson inspired patch but something like this. <laughs>
Next up's the third setting, compact, and it sounds like this. Next up, shimmer, it sounds like this. Next up's Lord Purple. I'll leave it up to you to kind of figure out what that one's supposed to be, like this. Next up's Mellow Flutes. Definitely for all the Beatles fans out there, like this. Tone setting number seven is blimp when you want to channel some John Paul Jones, like this. Next up's the setting press tone, which is definitely Billy Preston, so yet another Beatles uh, kind of tone patch here, but like this. Last but not least, setting number nine is Telstar, and it sounds like this. Keep in mind, that was kind of a generic, you know, demo of the organ machine, because I left the knobs exactly the same, and then just moved through each, you know, preset or tone. And, you know, the dry was all the way off, organ all the way up, and then click and mod were both at 12 o'clock. So once you start playing with the controls and the knobs, it radically changes the sound, especially like the speed of like a rotary effect or like the modulation effects, the shimmery kind of upper, you know, register in certain sounds. Like if you roll it off, it gets kind of muddy and bassy, and then if you roll it up, it gets kind of bright and shimmery. Really interesting and inspiring pedal too, and I've noticed I'm playing totally different now that I've been playing with that pedal. I wanted to share one more thing in this episode, and that's something I recorded literally last night. I was kind of funking out with uh, this kind of Goblin-inspired track, and that's one thing I noticed with Goblin's music. Yes, they're known for horrific and mysterious and eerie sounding music, but they also snuck funk in all over the place. And I'm a huge funk fan too, but uh, this is the song Nilbog, and this is the first solo, but like this. Hold on, it's coming. Something like that. So that literally just happened last night. I'm kind of excited. Obviously, that's the most recent thing I laid down. And I really was proud of the funk groove because I'm trying to serve up, you know, a faithful tribute to everybody. Um, you know, Claudio and Massimo, but then also uh, Fabio, too. Fabio Pignatelli is a monster bass player. And every track definitely has that very distinct and driving, you know, bass attack and sound. All right, that's going to wrap this episode of Brewster's Millions of Rants with the Goblin album. And I wanted to put this together mainly because I have had viewers ask, like, can we see, you know, your process or kind of what you do when you're, you know, recording and working on music? That's what I'm attempting to do here. And I thought about actually, like, turning the camera on and filming myself literally working on the album. But I really can't do that. I tried. 
But then, you know, the problem there is I'm distracting myself from what I'm supposed to be doing, which is recording and writing. And I've discovered I was more distracted with the camera. And I, you know, literally was more focused on the camera and the fact that I was filming myself than the music and what I was supposed to be doing, which was recording, you know, and writing the music and stuff. So I don't like doing that. And I've seen a lot of people do that where they kind of put a fly on the wall, you know, camera in their studio and they film themselves, you know, being creative or recording. I can't really do that because the camera is such a distraction. I don't want to distract myself, obviously, if I'm working on music. I need to be focused, and that camera is definitely a big distraction. So um, this is my humble attempt at trying to kind of reveal like some of what I do when I'm working on music like this, and this is the 20th year that I've been putting music like this and albums together. So I'm obviously very inspired, very excited, and really proud, too. So anyway, leave some feedback and comments. Please subscribe to my lessons, and I'll be back before you know with more content and material. Thank you.